Techolatza is, according to Shuachuyam, the name of the first man of the Chilchoyok tribe. Shuachuyam are the stories about, you know, a long time ago when the elders explained the world wasn't quite right, when animals and people could um, talk to each other, animals and people could transform from one to the other. Through the Shuachuyam part, I think, you know, we're, we're all connected. The name Techolatza belongs to our family and are all of the descendants of the original Tukhalatza. And there are many, many, many of us. But at this particular point in time, there are only two of us that actually carry the name Tukhalatza. It's a celebration of the return of Stone Tukhalatza to his community after 114 years of being absent from this place. The main story with regard to Tukhalatza is the story of how he was turned into stone. Uh, Chals was given the responsibility to walk through our lands and make things right. And in walking through our lands, he was confronted by a number of times by people and different situations that were going against the laws of the land and uh, the uh, rules of, that we got from our Creator. So Chals was, of course, given the task of making those things right. One day he happened to be walking down the Chilliwack River and uh, came upon a man and a woman on the riverbank and they were arguing. And Howells intervened and told this couple that there were better ways of resolving conflict other than through arguments or, conf or fighting. And it happened that the man was a bit of a medicine man himself. He had some powers. And of course it was at a time when that wasn't uh, unnatural. Men and women of that time had powers that were given to them. Well, this particular man, whose name happened to be Techolatza, had some powers. So they decided to resolve the conflict between Chals and Techolatza by way of a, a transformation contest. And the contest went that one of them tried to turn the other into salmon. The other tried to turn the other into a root, a twig. And then the other tried to turn the other one back into mink. And so it went, it went back and forth. And finally, Chals turned Techolatza into stone. He then turned to Techolatza's wife, who was still there at the riverbank, and instructed her to the point that she was then made responsible for taking care of her husband. And she would do that by taking the stone Techolatza back to the village, placing Techolatza in, in, a, in, a, in a place in front of her home or in her home where all of her family and all who came to visit her would see him. And then in seeing him would be reminded that we all need to live together in a good way. So then they made an arranged marriage. So one of the women from here went down to Sumas to marry, marry someone down there. And she was also the person that was given the responsibility to look after that stone. So she took that stone and carried it with her down there. And then, of course, the rest of the Squalco goes to say that, you know, after the lynching of Louis Sam happened, uh, uh, the attempted lynch lynching of uh, Jimmy Poole from Kilgard, and then the people there living on a reserve close to the boundary between the U.S. and the USA and Canada, were a bit concerned that those Nooksack settlers might come up and, and lynch some more of them, so they moved away and that left that left Tichulatza in, or Tichulatza in the in the field there. Shortly after the families left that village, two farmers, two white farmers, two brothers, the Ward brothers, were probably out hunting, taking care of their families. And they came upon our ancestor. And because there happened to be nobody around at the time, because they, were, they left for, for fear of getting hung, in their culture, if there's no one watching it, then they assume that he's been abandoned. In our culture, he was still in our territory. 
He was still in our care. He was still in our possession, but not to the people who came from Europe. So they took him and they sold him to a dime store museum. We are here today to celebrate the repatriation to the Nooksack Indian tribe of Tukwilatsa. This is accom was accomplished with the support of the Stolo Nation under the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. One of the parts of repatriation that uh, sometimes people don't understand is what an incredible boon it has been for museums. For the first time, uh, members of Native American communities have felt that not only was it okay for them to come into the museum and behind and see the collections, but it was appropriate, necessary, and part of the law and required that they come and consult with us. And for the first time, we had Native Americans coming regularly into the museum and part of the collections and talking with archaeologists about the meaning of objects and how they should be stored. Um, it was an unanticipated, wonderful outgrowth of the law. And m this museum, the Burke Museum, is an um, extremely better place because of the repatriation laws. One of the things that um, our grandmas uh, made very clear to us is that we need to follow some of the old ways. Um, two of our sisters did exactly that. They wanted to honor our ancestor. And by making a sacred cape for him, we believe with all of our hearts that he is the embodiment of our ancestors. He the man who was turned to stone, his shkuli, his soul, his spirit, is very much alive in our ancestry here. And that's the reason that he is being covered such today. This is for us, his family, to indicate to him that we know he is real, we know he's alive, and he's coming home. The citizens of Washington State own the collections of the Burke Museum collectively. Uh, therefore, even if ethically we believed it was a good idea to return the stone figure, without an explicit legal mandate, we couldn't return it to the Native community. So until we had that, that NAGPRA claim filed on behalf of the, the Nooksack tribe with the support of the Stolo Nation, the Burke really couldn't take any action to return the stone figure. Uh, last October 2005, we received a very thorough claim that laid out how this stone figure met one of the definitions of the law, which is object of cultural patrimony. And that's a pretty unique uh, category within the law. Uh, there are fewer than 300 objects of cultural patrimony nationwide that have been repatriated to date. And this is the first uh, case where the Burke has repatriated something uh, as an object of cultural patrimony. Uh, in 1992, the Stolo Nation were first interested in receiving this object back. At that time, we didn't have a vehicle since they were a British Columbia First Nations group. It wasn't possible for the Burke to directly repatriate under NAGPRA. So once the Nooksack Indian tribe got involved, then at that point, and it was clear that they had made their claim, um, that was allowed a process where consultation needs to take place. And after consultation and there's a claim that clearly proves that an object meets one of those categories, we can then repatriate to the communities. This is really a heartfelt release that this is finally happening. Uh, I know Grandma is really feeling good that this is coming home. My grandmother was charged with being one of the individuals responsible for the stone to come back home. Um, she was also one of the ones that was responsible for taking care of Tikwalatsa. From the time that he was transformed into stone up in the Chilliwack River Valley, it's been the women of our family who have been responsible for caring for him. It's been quite a few years and you know, it's, it's a, a, like a, in Seattle I was saying, it was a sad occasion, but it was a happy occasion. Just because my mother is not here, uh, my other aunties, they're gone as well. 
And so that's the sad part, but with the happy part is uh, Tikvalatsa is finally coming, coming back to where he belongs. Naming tribes is just area, you know, Nooksack, Lummi, Tlaila, you know, you, you got them separated because of the name. This is something that, that wasn't our way. You know, we're all one people. You know, that border doesn't exist to us. Tikvalatsa was found out there in Sumas, but here, 114 years, there was a reason for this, you know, I mean, He's there for teaching, he's there for people to remember, and now he's doing this again, bringing everyone back together. When I came here in 2000, the stone was in my office. It was actually the only thing in my office when I arrived here. There was no other furniture. Um, there was just, just the stone. So he greeted me on my first day of work at the Burke Museum. And um, later Julie told me that she had kind of developed this relationship with the stone and that she felt that the stone was unhappy in that space. And I also kind of picked up on that vibe pretty quickly, but there was no other place to put him for a while. We were reconfiguring our storage areas, but eventually we found a new spot for him in one of our storage rooms uh, down in the archaeology collections. About, I think, two years after I started here, um, I first met Herb Joe, um, who's the um, Stolo tribal member um, who came to visit and was making a, uh, beginning to make a request to have this stone returned. And at the time, um, I believe it was one of his, either his grandmother or someone on his mother's side of the family had told Herb that um, um, we should be putting the stone to sleep every night and waking him up in the morning because he's a person. Um, so he, we talked about this with him and we agreed that we would put a muslin sheet over him um, when we left work in the evening and turn off all the lights. And then in the morning, we'd take that sheet off and and turn on the lights and kind of wake him up. As I've learned more about his story over time um, from Herb and other folks, um, I've, I think I've gained this whole new understanding of the stone and I'm actually gonna be really sad to see him go. I worked at it long enough that I think I had faith that it was going to happen. I just didn't know when. by the family uh, you know, that belongs here at Nooksack to help them bring Tikwalatsa back to Canada for, for you know, f from this side over there. I mean, in, in order for us to let go and let it go home, we have to show the people here at Nooksack really that, you know, we're doing a good thing for the people as well as the family. Family's here, but, and it's kind of to explain to them and also Tikwalatsa, his people here, that he's going home over to, to Canada. This is, this is what, I, what I believe, this is what I was told. It's a happy occasion, and it, it, it deserves a lot of celebration, which we are doing right now. I have a very special thank you to Two very, very fine people, two dear friends of ours. Megan and Peter were two of the people at the Burke Museum who were very much instrumental in having our application be successful. If it weren't for these two fine people, we'd still be struggling trying to get the application approved. most unique NAGPRA repatriation cases I've worked on and I've been happy to be a part of it and uh, really enjoyed getting to know the communities that we've been working with. Um, and I think just on a personal level I really believe that ethically it's the right thing to do. I think um, for a long time I've believed that even though there wasn't, a, until there was a legal vehicle we couldn't legally transfer this object but um, I think ethically that NAGPRA is a civil rights issue. And I think that Native American communities should have the say of where their sacred, most sacred and central objects go. Um, and if they're needed in the communities that they're serving, they should probably be in those communities rather than in a museum and subject to research. On behalf of my family, all our family, yes, you could say. 
Thank you so much for all of the help and support that you've given to us over these years. And hadn't been for you, I'm sure that I would have given up by now. And thank you again. Thank you so much. I had doubt that this would happen, you know, with the government uh, bureaucracy. I figured that they'd, we'd get led on little ways and the door would close on us. Um, but I believe this was amazing how it, the doors kept opening up for a way to, repre uh, to bring them back home. There is a lot more stuff down there in the different museums that really needs to come back to us, to our people. It's, uh, I couldn't go down there because it's like going to a hospital, going to some place where your people can't leave there and they, they cry out and they wanna, want you to come home, want, they wanna come home with you and it hurts. Okay, this is our land. We need to, take, need to take care of everything that belongs to us. So when you look at that statement, it's not only a statement of our Aboriginal right and title to everything that's around us, but also there's an obligation there that we need to take care of everything that belongs to us. So now you start looking at different elements of our culture and our history. What are those elements? What are those things that are out there that we need to take care of? And we only listen to our elders and turn to our elders and they tell us, Shukwiam. we need to take care of those Shukwiam. We need to take care of our Skwalkwal, right? We need to take care of our Shwali, take care of our language. It's all these different things that we need to take care of. You know, so to me, that was a big part of today's ceremony as well, is that we're taking care of something, right? Something that left us, you know, we were probably remembering it in our hearts, like the family members, the elders still remembering it in their hearts and that, and then finally it's brought back and they're take, taking care of it. So to me, it's like a big step for our own self-government reasons as well. Creator in his, in his wisdom, uh, decided to, to take certain uh, people and make an example out of them. And so throughout the nation you have these stone figures which represent rules or values that we have actually now in stone. And our, our constitution has always been here then. Our rules of conduct, our rules of behavior, and the way that we think, our moral values, and they actually situated around the Stalin nation. And they not only define our nation, but they define how we're supposed to conduct ourselves. So, yeah, our constitution has been there uh, and uh, it really is uh, written in stone. So the Tekulata stone is part of that complex, in my view, of, of this, these written rules, which are very, very important. So you grew up with the transformation stories. You grew up with stories about um, how these items would come back to us one day. So there were prophecies that um, those that were that that was taken away would come back to our people. Repatriation is something that's happening more and more um, and becoming and more and more it's it's resulting in more and more success I think uh, as as First Nations engage in this process. The significant part of that is the filling of gaps that have happened in the communities, I think, over the last 150 years here, uh, and returning a sense of balance, restoring to balance elements of the communities that are currently not in balance and directly tied into the loss of those things and the loss of the responsibilities that go along with those things, the loss of self-governance over, over themselves, them, you know, Stalo and, and what belongs to them. The name Tukolatsa belongs to our family and all of the descendants of the original Tukolatsa. But at this particular point in time, there are only two of us that actually carry the name Tukolatsa. That's uh, Simon Roberts of the Roberts family. Uh, he carries Tukolatsa. That name was given to him by his grandmother uh, when he was a little boy. I am the other 
name carrier of Tehualatza itself, the, the, the proper name. However, there are others who carry derivatives of the name. Uh, there are two people in Chehalis who carry the name, Kelsey Charlie and his son, Kelsey Jr., both carry Tehualatil, which is the brother name to Tehualatza. We also have um, two female carriers of the name, uh, Eleanor Joe, who carries Tichwilwit, and uh, Kotaslowit's granddaughter, uh, Jason Malloway's daughter. Her uh, name is uh, Tichwilathia. So that's the, another female version of the name. And finally, we have uh, uh, my grandson, Kurt Joe, who carries the junior version of the name. His name is Tsitskolatza. What's going to take place is our family from across the line have an honored prayer song to welcome our ancestor back home. This is a song the boys themselves composed to honor his homecoming. This is. Um, it lifts a, a big cloud or a big uneasiness that something is still missing within the family. Now it's back. Now he's home. One of the things that has in his heart and in his mind, our young brother standing here, has been there for a long term for the family and has done many things to help out, make this possible. What the family wishes to do is acknowledge him, cover him, and showing them claymation, his family, for all that hard work they have done together. My involvement has been as an archaeologist, I say archaeologist, you know, I, I do, my work has evolved significantly after the last nine years or ten years of working here in the Stalo communities. To, to be really quite broad. Um, so I've applied my background and my, my skills uh, to, to help the family out in doing the research and, and writing the report basically that uh, substantiated the claim. So I was a very, very proud thing of, of having that, well having been given that responsibility and tr entrusted with that responsibility to, to help out that way. What can you say uh, to someone in my position except to recognize you all and to give you my heartfelt thanks. I'm really thankful that um, a lot of people got involved. A lot of people decided that this was a very worthwhile project and personally got involved and lend a hand in doing whatever they could. And if it weren't for all of these people being involved, we certainly wouldn't be sitting here today. We wouldn't have um, been successful in the application. Not that I would have ever stopped the process uh, of repatriation. I, I think that that would have, what might have been my life's job, if you will. Uh, it was a task given to me by the grandmas, and I would have tried to accomplish it through my lifetime. And, uh, any future name carriers would have then had that responsibility to give them to them. Just like the beginning of time. When Don Texwalala brought people together, he continues to do that today. He brought together in those days families. But the message that Lieutenant Governor wanted me to share with you today is Don Texwalala is bringing together nations. So the success we've had and all of the people that have been involved have lent a helping hand. Um, all I can say is just thank you.